Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Joachim Adenusi. Uh, today, I'll be looking at developing a risk management program for your organization. I'm a certified fellow of the IRM, and I believe uh, that the Institute is uh, sort of driving more, lots of initiatives to support lots of risk practitioners out there. So <clears throat> I'm going to make it as practicable as possible. Uh, forgive my croaky voice. Uh, I'm just recovering from probably cold, so I'll try and speak as loud and slow as possible. Thank you. And please, um, you can ask me a question. I'll be watching out for the question button, and also I'll be asking you some questions as well as we go along. So the content of the day is actually to just sort of dot around introductions, some basic things we know about risk management and some other ideas that I've developed from the point of looking at how risk program could actually be effective in an organization. Then I'm going to look at risk program itself. Uh, risk program, looking at governance, policies, framework, and then implementation. Then lastly, try to talk about theory versus experience. Um, sometimes people see the risk management subject or enterprise risk management subject a bit theoretical. Um, they do it because they are asked to do it. They're forced to do it. Um, they don't like doing it. They hate doing it. And sometimes some of the risk practitioners also, we make it difficult for them because the way we approach it, the way we engage them. So hopefully at the end of today, I'll be able to share some tips on how to make these boring subjects more relevant to your organizations, um, to drive change without using compliance stick. I believe it is easy or it is easier to drive risk program from a compliance point of view. Um, that will force people to listen or force them to do it. But to do it without um, compliance thinking will be amazing to just see how people are responding to it. Then finally, how to sustain uh, ERM momentum in your organization also. Now, I have um, a bit of something which I've introduced storytelling a few years ago. Um, I'm African, probably you'll have guessed that from the way I speak. I am based in the UK, I uh, walk across the globe. But you find out that I love proverbs. And one of them, the two proverbs I want to share with you, one says, it is not necessary for the fingers to look alike, but it is necessary for them to cooperate. I think the essence of this proverb is that any organization you find yourself there are diversity, varieties of talents, um, skills, and capabilities. It is okay to have differences. It is okay for people not to look like you, speak like you, have the same kind of thinking. Like that's why we're risk managers. But it is essential for us to make good music. We must work together. As you will uh, imagine, it to be impossible to play or good music without the fingers coordinating and playing on the piano. And the second one is a bit funny because uh, it's like the story of two goats. These goats were stranded in the Sahara Desert, <clears throat> and they were thirsty. And then they discovered water. Rather than the goats taking turn to drink the water, they started fighting because they believed they both have strong horns, and they wanted to test who is the strongest. So the proverb says, two goats with locked horns cannot drink from the same bucket. Now, why is that important? Horns signify strength. Your horn is your strength. In most organizations I've seen, rather than individuals in the organization complementing one another, they tend to use their horns to fight one another. And as a result, they spend a lot of time doing a lot of more in-house or in-fighting because somebody wants to prove they're better than the other or they want to show that they're stronger than the other. And while they're doing that, the threats and the opportunities or the things that are actually in front of them will sort of escape their attention because they're busy fighting, busy um, testing who is the strongest. But for any organization to thrive, it's not about how strong you are. It's about how you can cooperate and work with other people. Then also, one of the things I love about Stephen Covey, which is one of the books I've read about the habits of highly effective people, I try to share this with risk practitioners because I believe 
these habits are habits that will actually help a lot of risk practitioners out there. One, as a risk person, I believe that it's important to have initiative to be very, very proactive. Proactive meds is what will turn this boring subject into something exciting. Risk management is still growing. Uh, risk management is not like other professions which have been established years. Even though it has been in existence subconsciously, but the, uh, the the formality of the subject is just coming around the last 25 to 30 years, really, um, beyond insurance. So, highly effective habits, uh, habits of highly effective people, specifically for a risk manager, will be one: take initiative, being proactive. Also, there must be focus on there must be focus on goals. What am I trying to achieve? What are the goals? What do, we, what do I want to get out of this program? Then out of the goals, we must be able to set priorities because sometimes we have so many things we want to do as risk practitioners. But the question is, where do we start from? Which one is critical? Which one is important? Which one do I pick first? Which one um, do, do I focus on as a department? Which one do we focus on now? Then the fourth one says, they only win when others win. Now, as risk practitioners, we are there. Well, I'm, going, I, I'm a bit ahead of myself now. We are in the second line. So we enable others in the organization to win. So actually, in our proactiveness, when I say our, the risk practitioners now, we have to look for a way to look out for other people winning. We find out that our success actually depends on their own success. And I'm going to explain that a little bit further. So really our role is to support them to see how they can deliver their own priorities and using all our skills, capabilities, tools, adding to theirs to help them to achieve their objectives. Then the, 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 fourth, the fifth one says they communicate, which is key. One of the key strengths of a good risk management program is ability to communicate clearly, ability to explain to all the stakeholders there's a bit of marketing that I think we underestimate in risk management. We need to actually do a lot of internal branding, internal marketing to the internal stakeholders, not just the external stakeholders. I will imagine most organizations, when they're preparing for maybe a regulatory visit, uh, it, it takes a lot from them. They will plan, they will do the presentation, put all the PowerPoints together, lots of effort to welcome the regulators or the people inspecting your risk program, but do we put the same effort into trying to impress our internal stakeholders? I think that's the question. Do we try to brand what we're trying to communicate? Do we try to explain it to them? Do we try to make it really appealing, simple enough for them to understand it? Then also, um, um, habits of highly effective risk practitioners will be they cooperate with others, they reflect on and repair their deficiencies. It's important to understand our limitations as risk practitioners. Then finally, so when they find their voice, they help others to find theirs. I think that's very much in line with the uh, fourth one. You say they only win when others win. Yes, we are qualified. Yes, we are good at what we do. But we need to go ahead to go and help others, to look out for them, to support them, to be able to make them to find their own voices as well. Also, as a way of introduction, any organization will have clearly defined mission, vision, aims, and objectives, goals. Objectives are statements of specific outcomes that must be achieved. Now, a very good risk program must align with the organization's mission, vision, aims, and objectives. And I'm going to explain this a little bit more. From my experience, Part of the difficulty in getting people to understand risk management comes from the fact that what they are doing day to day, they can't see how it fits into the risk register or some other things we're telling them to do. So they understand that they have to do something, but they're saying that they're too busy doing something else that they don't have the time to do what we ask as risk practitioners or risk officers or chief risk officers asking them to do. So they can't see the correlation between what I'm doing my deadlines, and this risk I'm doing. So, for example, an organization could have said they want to have a market share of 30% next year, 
and drill down to sales per customer for the five pounds. And say shop sales will be 500,000. I think going to that specificity and beginning to think from that angle will help start building the momentum of a sustainable risk program. But the moment you have your mission, vision, goals and objectives articulated, then you find that there are issues. You're going to discover there are issues will come and there are opportunities also. Then the issues and opportunity versus the outcomes and the performance. So in the mind of ordinary manager or those who are running the business, they're more concerned about how do I deliver these tasks or how do we prevent poor reputation or things like that. So those were the uh, concerns in their mind. Then the question for us in building risk programs is further, how do we integrate what they are thinking with this subject so that the subject will help them. They won't see it as obstacles. They won't see it as a burden. They won't see it as, oh, you're just wasting my time, that kind of thing um, as well. Then another thing I want to introduce, this is my concept. I've introduced a, I designed a concept called the DOT principle, D-O-T. Now, over the years, from my experience, just thinking about why is it that people still struggle with the concept of sustainable risk program in organizations? And I thought there are three dimensions. I mean, there are a lot of dimensions. <coughs> um, this is kind of a principle I'm, trying, I'm developing still. There are three dimensions I've seen that are key, which we need to help ordinary staff or anyone in the organization to understand. The first dimension of the D, which is the decision. You're there day to day, you're going to make lots of decisions. Whether you are a senior staff, whether you're a junior staff, whether you're a director or CEO, the moment you step into your organization, you're going to have to make decisions for that day. And most likely or often, the decisions will impact on the objectives, the tasks that you've been given, or the set of goals that are in front of you or expectation from somebody else. So there's a kind of a conundrum between I have decisions to make, I have tasks to deliver, but what makes it even more complicated is that you don't have time. You're constrained by time. Some of those decisions we have to be so quick within a day, within an hour, or some might be a longer time, medium time, but within these three dimensions, you will discover that most individuals in organizations, they are actually grappling these three dimensions. Objectives, set of goals, expectations from line manager, from external stakeholders, decisions I'm making, the quality of my decision. Also, they find that I don't have time. I have time to make those decisions and to deliver them. So, now, between these three, we determine the outcome the performance of the person, the success or the failure of that individual or the organization or the department. But also, within these three dimensions also will come the reward that you will get as a result of good decision or if there are other places for reprimand for bad decisions. So that means within decision and time, you're faced with lots of uncertainties. And that's where I describe where the risk is. And the risk in my terms is looking at opportunities and threats within that the time, between the time I'm making the decision and the time to, to evidence the delivery and then the set of goals I have in front of me, I am not sure what's going to happen. But the quality of my decision will determine my outcome, my performance, my success, my failure, or my reward. And we're looking at something that will hinder me from achieving those goals or something that will help me an opportunity, hinder a threat. So you see that I've sort of started using simple terms, uh, trying to communicate the risk program, the importance of risk already from the point of setting strategy, aligning with performance management, aligning with objective setting, aligning with individual tasks as well. Please, if you have any question, I'll be watching the question button. Just type and I'll, I'll be happy to answer them. Then, so really, 
when we talk about risk management, uh, it's simply risk that uncertainties plus management. So really, it affects everything you can imagine in management, in planning, in motivation, uh, and, and resourcing, and people. It affects everything, financial planning, um, margins and acquisition, everything. So when you think, when we think in terms of risk management program has to do with everything that the management is trying to do, then looking at the uncertainties around it. So it covers every dimension. So we're not doing it because someone said we should do it. We're doing it because we're conscious of our objectives. We're conscious that we have time constraints. We're conscious of the fact that we're going to have to make a set of decisions, and we're conscious of the fact that within those three dimensions, we are going to be, um, we're going to see the result, the outcomes, the evidences, and all the other things we need to do as well. Uh, let me ask the, the, the first question. I just want to find out from you in your organization, is it difficult to sustain a risk program? I just want to find a yes or no. Um, from the uh, from the uh, question, please. So, um, now now in setting up risk program. I've divided into three big areas. One, I'm looking at the risk governance. So risk governance, there are core values. Uh, looking at the board, the senior management team, the staff, the concept of three lines, communicating and reporting. Do they really understand why we're doing this thing? Do they understand it? And just talk about risk governance. I'm going to go a bit deeper. So. What is the risk structure? Do we have a separate risk structure from the business structure, or is it the same? In my view, I think it is important that uh, when we say we're creating risk structure, or risk governance structure, actually it shouldn't be the same. It, it shouldn't be sorry. It shouldn't be different from the normal business structure, except to if the business structure is faulty. So we want to align the governance, risk governance structure, with the existing. Um, risk management structure. So looking at how do we communicate issues from the board to the senior management team to the staff. And then how do we escalate issues from the bottom back up. So that will assume that we have to look at the concept of three lines. We have the, the first line, everyone in the organization designing who are the first line, who are people responsible uh, for the the first line of defense or offense, or I'm sure that is changing these days. I, I'm avoiding using the three lines of defense, but the first line. So these are the people that have first contact with the world. They're able to, they the one delivering the objective. They, the one actually responsible for implementing the vision of the organization. They're the one responsible for ensuring that things are done. That includes also the board of directors. Then from my experience also, I found that you have uh, different structures at the board level. Some we have audit committee, some we have audit and risk committee, some we have risk committee. Whichever structure that you're running, it doesn't matter. But the most important thing is that the board, do they really believe in the risk management? Or are they doing it because part of what is assumed to be best practice for corporate governance? And how do they engage with risk management issues? From where are they looking at it from? So when you're making a board decision, and there are critical decisions to make, do you do they look at the risk implications of those decisions every time? Or is it that we just have a risk committee looking at the risk register, and there's another committee or another group making another decision, and there are different decisions going on, but actually, you couldn't tell if um, those decisions are actually risk-based or they are looking at the opportunities or threats to the decisions within the time frame. So sometimes 
from what I have seen, uh, it seems to be there a bit of a silo, even at the board level, where um, a group, a committee can be talking about something, and that committee coming about something, but, and there's a group dedicated to just talking about risk. And that group might not necessarily look at other things. So sometimes the report comes and it, it will look at other decisions. So what I'm trying to say is the fact that from a leadership point of view, the understanding of the board and the way the board itself interacts with the risk program, very, very critical to the success of the program. And what I think will which should happen, or what I think will happen, is that, that the board should, from just like the first slides I showed you, starting from what are we trying to achieve, the key objectives, and they have to make a decision, and they have time. What are the uncertainties? What are the consequences? The good one, the bad one, and what should we do? I think with that kind of engagement, you find out that the concept of risk management program or embedding ERM in the organization will be will not be as difficult as if we make it uh, like kind of a silo and they report in a separate format that's all so because they're very very busy it's difficult also to engage the, the time of the board and to be able to get them most of them probably also they're very very experienced people so but do they really understand really what the subject is doing or is it just we're doing it because we're asked to or we have to do it is good for us? And part of the thing I tend to look at for, if I look at the board report and look at all the risk decisions, I want to trace when was a particular decision made? Can I trace the impact of that decision in the organization? Say, for example, Q3 or Q1 this year, the board made a decision on X, Y, Z and directed the director of finance to implement those things because of the risk implications or opportunity or threat on the business. Now, I would like to check. So from the time that decision was made and passed down to the senior management team, what happened? What has changed? What are the evidences that the decision made by the board actually doing something driving the performance, driving the objectives, getting the organization closer to its goal as possible. So those are the kind of things we want to start checking in terms of the practicality of of, of this kind of uh, um, setting a, a risk management program up. Then coming back to senior management team also, then you find out that also, First, in terms of risk management, if I talk about senior management, we want to understand the key functions in the organization. <clears throat> you discover that not that some functions are not important, but you find that there are critical functions in your organization that actually they tend to get the attention of the management team or the board than the rest. Uh, for example, it could be finance, or it could be legal, it could be compliance, or design, or engineering. So how do we align the risk management within those key functions? How do we work with them? How do we ensure that, one, they are part of developing the capability to manage risk? If you're working in an engineering firm, for example, and you have lots of engineers, and they're the one designing all the new inventions, the technology, and everything, I will believe that the risk function, because they are so, they're core to the business, they're core to the operation, I want to identify and see how can I work within that engineering design and see how risk management principle, the risk management process can align with their design process as well. as well. So trying to get alignment between the key functions and also the risk principle also is important. So I have a question here. What is the process and tool you use to monitor the top-down decision. Um, I think, let, just to answer that question, there are different tools you can use, but I think that this, if you don't have a system in place, that the simple thing is just if you're the person responsible for risk decision, let's talk about risk decisions now. When you take the decision to the board and 
I believe the secretary will have to minute it. The actions that should be extracted and be added as part of somebody's performance indicator to be delivered. Now, that I'm a bit ahead of myself. This is where risk management actually is a performance tool. Because when you add that as a performance indicator, say the decision was the finance director to explore different funding options for the new project so that uh, the board can take advantage of the new opportunity. So, and to explore the funding option must have a time frame because without the time frame, you discover that the, the action will just be going on forever. There will be no specific time to, to look at whether that's been done or not. So, either the risk department working with the strategy or performance, performance department, adding it to your scorecard, should be able to look at, okay, this action was decided in January, due April. So we'll be coming to review what has happened to the action. And so if it's part of the person's KPI immediately, when you're doing your quarterly review or your monthly review or weekly review, you could sort of validate the feedback from that action. And then take it back to the board with the evidences that this is what has been done. And what else would the board want to do? So you find that that's like a, a, a complete cycle. So the decision was made. It was embedded at somebody's KPI. And somebody was responsible for monitoring it. And then the output with the evidence is taken back to the board for, find, for another decision or for further validation. I don't know whether that answered the question. Okay, sure. Another question is, should risk manager embed this to the Manager's KPI. That's a very good question. So, yes and no. Now, you know, when I was talking about um, the, the the collaboration between uh, risk, the risk function working with everybody else, the risk manager working with the department responsible for performance improvement. In fact, in some places, what they would do is to combine risk management and strategy and performance together. That's what in some organization, which I've seen, I've worked in that kind of organization as well. So that it, it's, you're not looking at risk as a compliance. You're looking at it as a performance tool. So in that whole big department, they'll call it risk, performance, and strategy. Because the moment those actions are coming and you have your scorecard system, it's just a matter of communicating and engaging with the responsible officers. These are the actions. They're due on social date, responsible to Mr. X and we need to get feedback. But the key thing is actually getting the evidence that, or the evidence that those actions are implemented. Those are actually the critical. So the risk manager can initiate it. The risk manager can um, sort of work with the person responsible with the line mind that's com communicated, but it's the directive from the board. So already we know the owner. It's just a matter of formally engaging the person to be able to accept it or not. I don't know whether that answers the question, but I'll keep on going on to this. Now. So the senior management team is another one. When we look at the risk governance, from my experience also, we find that most people, apart from the chief risk officer, if the chief risk officer is part of the senior management team, the others, it, they tend to be that struggle between trying to engage with senior colleagues sometimes. You know, you're trying to tell them we need to do this, Sometimes they're the one actually they they're the one that actually don't show the the support most, so it's difficult to go past them because they always think they're busy, they're busy, they don't have time, they don't have time. And the question I've often asked myself: What are they doing? What are they busy doing? It's either they're busy trying to deliver the objectives of the organization or urgent tasks that are given to them. If that is the case, then in their busyness they are managing threats and opportunities. Now, they might not acknowledge it, and they might not accept it, but in that business of, I don't have time, or I don't have time for this risk thing, they are doing that. So, the question is, how do we now engage them to see, or how do we align the busyness, or the clarity in their tasks, and the time, and the decision, to say, okay, you need to look, to look at the implication of uncertainties and all these things within the time we are trying to achieve it as well. How do we do that? 
how do we ensure that they see together? So that's where the issue of aligning the KPIs, the, the performance indicator, and somebody actively responds for monitoring uh, those KPIs in line with the risk as well. Now, I'm going to say something that's a bit strange. From what I've seen also, if, if risk program is done well, you find out that the fear of most people is that the risk department or the chief risk officer is trying to take over from them. They all of a sudden become so powerful in the organization. And that power or that influence could create insecurity amongst other senior colleagues because you are asking difficult questions. You are sort of staring key actions to be done. You are sort of helping organizations to see opportunities that they are missing. You are helping to discover threats that could hinder them or that could hamper their progress. And that role to me seems like the role of a CEO. So you can see why um, the, the, the risk function or the risk department sometimes can be seen as very intrusive. Uh, you're, 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 and people can sort of want to say, try to push you off. Because you're indirectly, when you're running a risk program, you're indirectly driving the performance of the organization. And people believe that it's only the CEO. And that's why, again, it's been said that the chief executive officer should be the number one risk champion in the organization. That's the reason, because the CEO driving performance. And next to that person with others will be you. So there's another question. Let me look at it. Um, someone said, what happens if risk maturity is low? Surely this will impact on the leadership of the risk management program. I completely agree with you. So in terms of the, the risk maturity, if you're just starting, if the organization is at the infancy and just starting to launch the risk program, the biggest part of trying to get the risk program going is actually to create awareness and understanding amongst colleagues. And if you can win the battle of that evidence or selling or showcasing or trying to persuade them, why they have to do it. But also, it must be visibly supported by the CEO, somebody extremely senior on the board. If you can get the CEO convinced and get someone at the board spot, at the level, that leadership convinced, or even if they're not convinced, but they're showing that visible support, you find out that initially people reluctantly want to do, um, for run the ARM program, but with time, if one has seeing the benefit and start understanding it, the maturity start increasing as well. I hope uh, that answers the question as well. So then, so really, the question about governance that do they really understand why their role? Do they understand that actually I am the risk manager? Another myth about risk program is that the risk department is naturally the one, not the one doing the risk management. I think the title risk manager sometimes is wrong for chief risk officers or risk officers because people tend to see you as the, you are the one doing the risk management. So in some banks, what I've heard, oh, please go and call the risk management people to come and do this. So they are referred to as they are the one doing it. And until we shift that responsibility back to individuals and organizations, you are responsible and you are the one that actually should be telling me the threats and the opportunities. You are the one that should be spotting those things. And I think that is the level which uh, the maturity and the engagement will start increasing. Um, just let me look at the question so far. So is it difficult to... So I think voting is still going on. I'll come back to that. Then let's talk about framework and policies. I mean, really, when we design, this is ISO 31000. Most of us who are aware of this, there's also COSO. I've asked questions so many times, what is it for, really, when we design framework? Why do we have a framework? Who is it for? Okay, if we have a policy, we design framework, are we designing those things just for compliance, for someone to see that we have them? I've seen great policies with 500 pages, 20 pages, policies, frameworks. And to my horror most of the time is the fact that when you look at what's written and what actually is being done, 
it's a huge gap between the two. So, yes, I'm writing all these things that this is what I'm doing, but if I'm going to the practice in the organization, what we're actually doing is different. So, how can we bring the framework and the policies to life? One of the things that helps is that for risk practitioners sometimes, when we're writing framework and policies, we write it for um, ourselves. We write it because we enjoy it, one, we understand the language, it's exciting, we can talk about the ISO, all the exciting things, but who else? If we're expecting other people to read, or if we're expecting other people to engage with the policy and framework, then I dare say or suggest that our risk framework and policies, actually, they're also a communication tool explaining to the whole organization the risk management program in different dimensions. Like, it could be you're looking at it from um, looking at the operational side. You're looking at it from a market side, the market risk, looking at investment. You're looking at it from a credit side. You're looking at it from a liquidity side, different policies. Those policies should be simple enough in such a way that somebody somewhere in the organization can have a look at them and it will give them an idea of, hmm, okay, so that's why we're doing that. Okay, that makes sense. So what are the policies for? What are they for? Um, why do we write those policies? Compliance or communication? And I think it's just developing a very good risk management program should send off towards the kind of policy and also I've seen a lot of people just copying policies and just writing something. It makes sense. Okay, as long as it looks it looks like the risk framework somehow. But really, this thing I'm writing, does it reflect us? Is it about us? Is it really specific to us? Can I share with my colleagues? Would they understand it? Um, will th this policy, how would it help them to further give them confidence in what we're trying to do in the organization? So the policies and the framework, whatever we decide to do. Again, people have um, so I'm basing my policy on ISO. So what does it mean to the head of um, admin, for example, or head of HR? So we're, we're embedding ISO, that and that. What is, what is it? I'm using COSO, I'm using PACE. I'm, so what does it mean to these guys? And who cares about the policy and framework anyway, apart from sometimes when we have to send it out to some people to have a look. But yeah, but we care. So the point is, everyone in the organization should be interested in your policy, should be, able, should be interested in looking at your policies and your framework. Um, I think, so I, I think, as the policy is just theoretical exercises, those are the two of the questions which I'm trying to also address. Let's just look at the votes. So is it difficult to sustain a risk program in your in organization? 73% says yes, 27% no. I agree that it's, 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 it's challenge is difficult sometimes, especially if the majority of the uh, risk in the organization is still low. Thank you for those who are voting. Then implementation. Let us look at, now, so we have governance in place, roles and responsibilities are clearly defined, the board terms of reference, we have reporting framework, we have the key functions, uh, we have the internal audit, external audit involved, we look at it from a people's point of view, adequacy of skills, succession plan, we look at different things in the governance. Now we want to talk about implementing uh, this particular program. Who is the person implementing the program? The personality and the temperament. Now, no matter how skilled or how qualified you are, when it comes to implementation of anything, the biggest thing I've seen is the skills necessary to engage the organization. Engagement, engagement, and ability to persuade is actually key. Yes, we need all the hardcore skills to be able to do stress testing, to be able to do capital model, to do different things. But no, it's part of the fact that we have all those skills. If the personality itself not friendly, if the temperament not patient, we're not able to gradually go to them, walk with them, grow with them, know them, know what they need. You find out that implementation becomes difficult. Now, 
they can implement it if you're running um, a program that's aligned with the regulatory requirement. Can I say this? What I discovered that most people actually will implement. They will be though they can be forced to do the implementation. They're not happy. They don't understand it. They hate what they're doing, but they're doing it. So you find out that there will be lots of money being spent, activities going on, implementation going on, but actually after the compliance, after the whole exercise is done, look at them, look back a year or two later, you discover that nobody cares about what's been done. Oh, yeah, we're fine now. We are A star, we are B plus, we are A plus, and that's it. So one of the things I've seen about implementation of risk management programs, Father, the person leading that implementation, key. The dynamics of the team player, that's why I started with the habits of highly effective people at the beginning of the session. Because to be able to implement the risk program, knowing that the subject is what people don't want to do and they don't understand it or they don't, they feel it's not relevant, your ability to persuade them, your ability to be patient with them, your ability to be able to engage with them, to sell to them, to prove gradually, to show them, will go a long way to uh, and choose them or to get their interest going. And there's another question. Uh, two questions. Commitment to implement the risk program, otherwise you're out. Commitment to implement the risk program, otherwise you are out of path. I, know, I don't understand that. How do you combat the attitude of risk management, a tick box ex exercise? I think I can talk about that. So one of the, it depends on what's driving. When you talk about how do you combat the risk management being a tick box exercise. If the people driving risk in the organization, they don't understand it, and I've said that before, you find that, that most people, if they're being forced by the regulatory requirements, so risk management will be a tick box. Two, if they can't see risk management as a performance tool linked to all the performance, all the tasks and objectives and delivery and use as a decision, then it makes no sense to them. But actually, they're managing the risk somewhere in their head, not formally, the way we will assume that it's um, a risk program. They're doing something. They are actually aware of the threats in their minds, except that they don't call it risk management because otherwise no business will exist without actively managing risk still today. So the only way to overcome the attitude of tick box exercise is to begin to start from what are you trying to achieve? So when you are engaging with your stakeholders, start with what are your key deliveries, what are your tasks? I mean, I don't know how many of you have been to different departments, sending email out, you say, oh, do you have any risk update? Without fail, they all come back and say no. <laughs> That's a classic. So you find that sometimes the risk department themselves, they are out of deck. They don't know what to do. They just send email out, or oh, please send me your risk update. They're sitting in one room. The guys just email everybody. Please. We need to do risk update now. Some they do it only twice a year. So when you do risk update twice a year, to the people in the organization, they see risk as something we do occasionally. They can't see it as something that is affecting what they're doing now. But actually, it is affecting what they're doing now. So it's helping them to say, okay, my objectives are this week to deliver one, two, three, four, five. And the question I will be asking is, that what are the things that will hinder you this week to, a, to achieve those things? Or what are the things that will help you this week to deliver those things faster? And they will tell you that, oh, this week, oh, these are my constraints, these are my issues, these are the issues, these are the things that will hinder us, and these are the consequences. Now, in a nutshell, they sort of identify some threats. Or these are the opportunities this week, but I'm not sure how we're going to take it. In a nutshell, they identify opportunities. And so it's helping them to go through that logical pattern of from the simplicity of it to when it now becomes something that they can see as relevant to them. I hope that and the other question is not clear. Please could the person ask again. So back to you, I'm still talking about implementation also. So Tools available uh, for most risk managers also we're limited in tools application. Um, one thing I've seen from my experience is also that it's difficult to want to apply the same tool across the whole organization. There must be a variety of tools. So that tells me that 
for your risk management program to be effective, the people driving the risk management, the, the risk itself, must be aware of different tools and different um, techniques and what will be applicable for Department A might not be the same with Department B. Even the risk identification tools, uh, the fact that I'm using something for finance department, it might not work for HR department. So, but all together, I should be able to identify and describe and look at the consequences of the decision, positive or negative, regardless of the tool I'm using. So, the tools and the applicability is also important. When you come from a one-sided tool, for example, in some organizations, they're very strong on quantification. And so, to other departments who are not that quantitative-minded, they find the risk program a bit tedious and boring. Just, oh, this is just too difficult. I don't understand it. And so they hate, they, they, they don't even want to engage with it because the guys, the people driving it, they're only, they're only driving one type of, one tool. You have to show me the calculation, show me the model, show me how it's fixed. But on the other hand also, there might be people who are extremely qualitative. They just, they, they, they're not into numbers. They're not into the facts and figures. And so, and some other people find it a bit difficult to engage with them because they are designed to work with numbers to make decisions. So, the, 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 the tools and the applicability in different departments will also help you in developing an effective risk program. There's another question. With tools, can the toolkit be issued to assist managers understand which tools and techniques are most useful for their situation? Yes, you can, you can um, issue a toolkit to the organization. In fact, most people sometimes, they have a list. But also, bear in mind, when you're doing this, it's a good idea, but there are limitations there. You find out that you are the risk manager. Probably you understand the applicability of the, uh, the use of the tools more than the ordinary staff. So what would be good is that, yes, you issue it, but make yourself available to help them to apply it. Because they will not go the extra mile in trying to um, do everything as you would do it. For example, if you issue guidelines on stress testing. Now, I imagine if the head of HR will willingly by itself just say, okay, I'm going to, um, I'm running stress test today with my team or for my department for to look at our resilience when it comes to uh, human resources. Do you understand? So, yes, they have the tool. The toolkit is there. But do you think they're going to willingly go and use it. So, yeah, the toolkit being available is for information, but the use also will come from you engaging with them for them to understand it. I don't know if that makes sense at all. Thank you. Um, continue. So, so, now, implementation is the relevance of the subject to everyday operation. So, most people also don't find risk measurements relevant to them. Um, they, they see it as something different uh, to what they do. And this is where I'm going to go back to my first slide. Let me just quickly go back to this slide, uh, this place. There must be clarity in objective and set of goals. Any risk identified outside what people are trying to do or achieve Weekly, monthly, quarterly, they are theoretical risks. I mean, they're not relevant. It won't affect them. It won't catch their attention. If it's something they have to do and they have to make a decision within a time frame, you will find out that most likely they will be interested because you're talking about what is um, what is important to them as well. You know, they they, they can feel what's in it for us is important. Why should I care about this thing? So, but the moment you start with, what are your goals? What are you trying to achieve? What are the key deliverables? This quarter, Q1 or Q4, we're coming to the year end now. What are the key KPIs that you need to deliver this Q4? And how can we look at the opportunities to maximize or threats to minimize delivery of those things? Another question. Are tools too much, are tools too much technically oriented so that they deter the functional units user to work with them. Yes, that's what I said the other time. If you just give them all the tools and you explain to them how to do, how to develop data to model market risk and um, 
the, your policies or framework are supposed to be something that people will be using to, uh, to, 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 to communicate, to make decisions. If they're too technically oriented, yes, they won't be able to use, but even if they're not, they have their own day-to-day -day job. So the reason why you have risk function is you have a group of skilled individual, people who are passionate about the subject, people who are, who are exposed to different tools and capabilities and their uses, and then they can go ahead, we'll come along guys, these guys, and help them to apply those tools without the department feeling, seeing it as a burden of themselves as well. I think so. I hope uh, that answers. So, so bringing it back to here, they must see the risk program must align to what people are doing day to day. Even if you look at the bathroom, the janitor. So why do we have to clean our bathrooms? Objectives. One, because we want to give our customer good experience and want to make sure when they come to visit us, um, we're giving, they have, they, they see us as we care. So the, the janitor, the guy cleaning the bathroom, we have KPI to go to the bathroom every four hours to make sure everything is okay. And he will have to make the decision about when to go there and the time. But if there is a problem, if there's a water bust or pipe bust in the bathroom, it's going to affect the ambience they're going to create. That's just as operational, as minute as it can be. So really, it's applicable to everybody. So talking about implementation. So what else do you think are critical to implementation? Let let me ask another question. Um, what is the, the next question? What, what are the top three issues affecting implementation and effective risk management program in your organization? Could you please? Start voting, please. Thank you. So, now, theory versus practice. I've talked about this invariably, the risk function. So if you look at the, uh, the risk department itself, what do we, when we're talking to the, the departments or the other stakeholders, non-risk department, what do we tell them? Um, do you go around asking for risk updates? So again, a very, very traditional approach to driving risk program. Oh, uh, what are you, do you have any risk? Do you have any risk? No, of course they will tell you no. So it's not going to ask them, it's engaging with them. It's engaging with them. The mapping risk to other processes. Again, one of the biggest tasks for the risk function is ability to be able to look at other processes in the organization that comes, the HR, the finance, operations, um, any other thing you do, compliance, audit, we should be able to look at, okay, how do we fit the risk program within, around this? So you understand the HR, what are the objectives, you understand the operation, what are the critical objectives, aligning it to make sure that it fits into all these other processes as well. Uh, risk and financial planning. Uh, recently, I, I had an experience where working on a board risk workshop, risk appetite workshop. And so, uh, we've been working on all the workshops and trying to look at uh, sources of data to be able to validate the risk appetite KPIs. And towards the end, we discovered that actually we've been setting risk appetite KPIs. And also, the finance departments are working on next year business plan and budget. And within those budgets and business plan, we discovered that there are also key KPIs on them. For example, when you look at the quarterly uh, growth for the business, so while the team working on the risk appetite is actually trying to come up with some kind of numbers, benchmarking with their colleagues in the industry, the, 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 the finance department, they have already a number which has been assumed and gone to the preliminary board finance committee approved to help them to be able to approve the finance for next year in terms of financial projection. So we thought, okay, is it possible that sometimes we're reporting two types of KPIs or our reporting are not aligned? And maybe this, that these are, this could be one of the reasons why there are conflicts in effectively developing a good risk program in the organization because the finance department, they are running these KPIs and they have their own deadlines and they are going to all the departments looking at all the numbers. But also the risk function will come and start 
looking for output from the risk appetite and tolerances. So we thought it should have been easier for us to align the two together. So, and which is a very, very classic textbook versus practice experience. So we started engaging with the finance department. Tell us all the financial assumptions you're looking at next year, in the next three years, your financial planning. So we're looking at staff attrition, we're looking at um, uh, paying off the debt, we're looking at shareholders' capital, return on capital, dividend returns, and all those kind of things. If we can get the data, is it possible to look at our own experience, either adopt what the finance people, they've concluded based on their own data, or we work with them to challenge it, and they adopt what the risk from the risk experience is looking at. So either way, you find out that when you correlate the two, you go to the board, you have one single version of story. And I think it would be easier if everyone in the organization is aware that the, the KPIs or the key budget deadlines that we are aiming towards, they are also ali in alignment with our risk appetite, which has been approved by the board. That is another uh, simple approach of beginning to align your risk program with your business models without saying you're doing risk management. So they are in consonant, they are in agreement together. And when we now decided to reconcile it, we discovered that actually uh, it made more sense to, 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 to sort of compromise some numbers between the finance and what the risk department is trying to do from a certain risk capital tolerance. So, and people have always asked me, which one comes first? Is it the risk appetite or the strategic objective or the financial plan? It doesn't matter which one comes first. The most important is that you're able to reconcile the two and you have one single version of truth rather than different reporting lines, different KPIs, and looking at risk from different angles. I don't know whether that makes sense. So then allocating responsibility and accountability. So these are also very, very critical when it comes to developing a very good uh, risk program. The leaders, the leader must show that uh, visibility, not just talking about risk, but using risk as a tool to make decisions for performance. The CEO, the senior management team, the board, they must evidence and model it, talk about it. Not just talk about it from a theoretical point of view that we're doing risk, but from how it's practically helping to advance the cost of delivering the business objectives. And I believe these are the simple tips that probably will help in developing a very good risk program. So finally, I think I want to see closer bonding between performance management and risk management. I think that's where your program will become alive even more. When we look at the correlation between good risk management and performance, is it possible to test that looking at our objectives, our goals, if we are managing risk effectively or we are improving on our risk management capability or we are good with our controls or we are good at taking opportunities, can we test whether actually those things help in our performance, either measurable performance or intangible performance, maybe from our reputation? Can we see the correlation between how good we are at understanding threats and opportunities and the outcomes from the business? And I think it is possible because in my work experience, I've seen it before, where we're able to evidence the relationship between implementation of risk and improvement in performance. And that's another way we can actually go to the exec and say, okay, let's try and test these two variables. Let's test the correlation between the two and see if it works. There's another question. Which person should allocate responsibility and accountability? RM, no. Risk management, that, uh, that's a very good question. I don't think the risk management department should be the one to allocate responsibility. As I said, said in the risk governance, your risk governance should sit with your normal business governance. So, if you have your organogram or your chart or reporting lines, wherever that is, that particular risk in delivering that objective align or whichever department is also linking to that department that should be responsible for it automatically. 
And I must say also that I prefer actually using name individual rather than just a head of department, head of finance. Name, tell, speci be specific about the name of the person. Mr. John with the finance department responsible for that. So the risk function, as a risk department, you don't have, you don't have anything to do with allocation responsibility or accountability. It's there. So you just work with the existing line. But the management and the leadership of the organization must respect and support and show visible um, support to ensure that those things are done. Another question, would you be able to talk a little around automation of some of the administration aspects of involved integration into existing workflow? Thanks. I mean, in, in, into the existing workflow, for example, if you, if you want to align risk process with your HR process, um, for example, now you could go to um, just sitting with the HR group, try to understand their objectives and their vision. Probably they have something to do with staff survey, they want to look at staff attrition, they want to look at motivation, they want to look at um, recruitment, they want to look at reward, performance, bonuses, and all those things. Now, so just look at these are objectives, looking at what are the threats to achieving each of these aspects of this human capital in the organization. Why do we have to do that? And what are the opportunities? What can we do? How can we balance it? How frequent do you want us to do staff survey? So automation, yes, if you have the system, but if you don't have automation, what you could do actually is just to work with the existing line that you have as well and just work with it. I think I just want to leave this with you as I go. Um, risk. Officers should be value-driven leaders. And um, somebody made this quote, and I love it, said, why are they special? They are the ones that inspire, motivate, and challenge others. When you're in risk department and you're driving risk program, you inspire people, you motivate people, you challenge others positively. They are the ones that put the needs of others as well as the needs of organization ahead of their own. I mean, if you're a risk function and you're driving risk program, that has to be the way forward. You will earn respect. People will see you as a resource. They don't see you as a pain, as a burden. They're the ones who pro provide alignment and direction. Because you understand the importance of clarity and objectives and decision making, so you are able to help people to bring alignment and direction. They're the ones who are engaged. They get the job done. They stand out from the crowd. They don't need to identify. You know who they are. Identify leaders by their actions and their performance. Real leaders will find you. You don't need to go looking for them. Now, when you see somebody willingly, proactively, intuitively working to support you, inspiring you, wanting to use their tools to, to make sure that you deliver your objective, to me, that's a risk manager. That's a risk professional. Because as risk professionals, our number one priority is to help others. And if they can testify that you're actually adding value to them, you're helping them, and if possible, quantify the impact of those values you find out that to begin to sustain the risk program will become easier in the organization. Also, to be able to get resource will be easier. I think there's one more question. Can ISO 38500 framework be used for risk management? I'm not sure which one is ISO 38500, actually. I will need to find out. If you can email me your details, I'll get back to you on that, uh, please. Thank you. Also, um, there are a couple of upcoming events in, uh, for the IRM. We have training coming up. If you're interested in more details about IRM information, we have a running effective workshop, practical risk appetite, managing reputational risk, have the, how to build and use a bow tie risk metrics, uh, risk champions two days, and presenting risk information half a day. So these are all the uh, available trainings that will help you in developing your risk program to the IRM. Uh, feel free to uh, contact and book. And if you have any other question for me, uh, please feel free to email me. I work both in the UK and Africa, and uh, you can follow me at Twitter at Joachim underscore Adensi, um, uh, tweet at me as well. Uh, please, I uh, hope my session, I mean, it's, it's, it's a big topic, so I've tried to collapse it within uh, just 60 minutes or an hour just to make sure that I'm able to give you some few tips that will help you start, but we'll be willing to support you further if you need more, uh, if you need help.
is the practitioner is the practitioner RM qualification subject to renewal. Um, renewal in terms of as a member of the institute, yes, you will have to regularly be renew your membership like any other professional qualification. But once you're qualified, then just be showing your CPD, your continuous uh, professional development to make sure that you're keeping up to date, like watching this webinar and some other things. All you just do annually after qualifying with the IRM is just to renew your membership annually. That's all it takes. And I would encourage anyone who wants to do that to go for it. Thank you. Can I have a certification completion letter or email for CP? CP? Okay, I'll, I can see some emails there. What I'll do is uh, I'll pick all the questions and I'll be able to respond to you and some I'll direct to the IRM to be able to help you. Uh, thank you very much. I hope um, the, 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 the one now you'll be able to get some things, some tips that will help you to develop effective risk, pro risk program. But most importantly, if you're driving risk program in your organization, be a bit humorous, be nice, be friendly, trendy, relevant, and just make them laugh occasionally. You know, if you, you know, just have fun doing it. Have a fantastic day. Thank you very much.